We're sat here in the library at the monastery where Gregor Mendel lived and worked and ended his life as the abbot. And I've written a book which is about an extraordinary debate that took place in the early 20th century after Mendel's amazing 1866 paper on experiments that he had done, crossing peas, suddenly became a talking point in European botany and then gradually in, in wider biology. And the debate was about whether this paper should or shouldn't become the centerpiece of the new quantitative experimental science of heredity. One side, the Mendelian side, was led by William Bateson. The other side was a man called Walter Frank Raphael Weldon. They were about the same age, Weldon born in 1860, Bateson born in 1861. They met at Cambridge, where they were students in zoology, and they were friends. But through the 1880s, they began to diverge, diverge in their scientific interests, diverge in their professional success. Weldon went from job to job to job. Bateson remained kind of stuck at Cambridge in fairly lowly positions. And then from the 1890s, the tensions began to grow and began to become public uh, as Bateson pushed his biological research in a deliberately anti-Darwinian direction, emphasizing the scope for new species arising, not gradually and adaptively, as Charles Darwin had said through the theory of natural selection, the theory that Darwin wrote about in The Origin of Species, but instead in one go, in a saltation. Weldon thought that was a huge mistake, and he devoted himself, on the contrary, to minute measurements of variation in shrimp and shore crabs to show that you could actually demonstrate natural selection taking place right now, the, the changes in a population over the course of a year would be so small that you could only detect them statistically, but that was the kind of work that Weldon was willing to do. So Weldon was a Darwinian to his fingertips. Bateson was opposing all of that. So in the background of the rediscovery of Mendel's paper, in 1900 is this simmering set of tensions between Bateson and Weldon. The word rediscovery is conventionally used to describe what happens to Mendel's paper, but it's, it's a pretty misleading term uh, in a lot of ways. For one thing, Mendel's paper was never really forgotten. Mendel wrote it as a contribution to the science of plant hybrids, and it was appreciated by specialists in plant hybrids and cited by them over the decades from the time of its publication in 1866 right on through till 1900. So it wasn't actually rediscovered. What it was was reinterpreted because over those decades, the problem of inheritance and how to study it had emerged for biologists as a central problem and the role of crossbreeding as a means for investigating that problem had for quite a few investigators uh, moved up the agenda as a really useful way of, of getting at inheritance. And so with a number of people crossbreeding to throw light on inheritance, Mendel's paper suddenly seemed to have been this lost classic showing the way. Uh, and so from 1900, it began to be talked about as this phenomenon. Bateson, above all, began to champion it in that spirit. Weldon was interested, read the paper, uh, began doing his own studies uh, of peas. And what he found was that other breeders' peas didn't look like Mendel's peas. And on the cover of my book, I have a photographic image that Weldon had made in which we see that, yes, there are some peas that are really green and some peas that are really yellow, but if you're not already committed to Mendel's view that green and yellow are the only options, if you're just open-minded and open-eyed, about the variability that's actually out there, as Weldon thought we should be, what you find is that you're able to fill in the gaps between greenness and yellowness. And what we see in the image is, is a spectrum. And in Weldon's view, that was far more representative of how bodies work, how inheritance works, because it's, it's as we would say now, multifactorial. For every character, there might be one bit of chromosome, which is especially important, but the effects of that chromosome will be interacting with the effects of other bits of chromosome and the effects of other parts of a developing body, that body developing in an environmental context. 
And all of that Weldon thought should be of interest to biologists. They shouldn't just regard it as complexity that we might get to one day. This debate flourished between 1902 and 1906, and it ended because the chief uh, opponent, the skeptic, Weldon, died uh, at the tender age of 46. Did this debate actually matter? Could it actually have been different for biology had Weldon lived long enough to publish that book, his theory of inheritance, and for the book to have been read? Would textbooks now be fundamentally different in some interesting way, or on the contrary, were we bound to have pretty much the same set of concepts, pretty much the same methods that we have now? Maybe we'd use different names for it all, but it would all be roughly the same. I thought it would be interesting to be empirical about this, right? To actually test it out. What difference did this debate make? And so I came up with the idea of writing an introductory course in elementary genetics as if it had come out of the history in which Weldon had lived to, if not win the debate, at least score some points. Uh, and so this alternative course, as I envisaged it, began not with Mendel and his peas and then complicated it and took it all back in the footnotes, but instead started with the notion that uh, any gene has its effects against a genetic background in a physico-chemical environment, and as the context change, the effects of a gene can change. So we start off from there, and then from that moment throughout the course, we hammer home this message that everything's interacting with everything else all the time, so that when students meet with Mendel's patterns, they encounter them not as the grand generalization, but as these interesting special cases, which arise precisely because we've stripped out all of the complexity. As our kind of control group, we had the students doing the ordinary uh, introduction uh, to genetics course, and our students and the uh, students on the, on the ordinary course were assessed on their attitudes to what's called genetic determinism, so the idea that heredity is destiny. And they were assessed before teaching and after teaching. And what we found was that students on the ordinary course were as determinist about genes at the end of teaching as they were at the start, maybe even a little more so, whereas our students on the Weldonian course were less determinist about genes, more ready to ask questions about what else might be going on. And in the 21st century, in my view, that's what we want from a genetics education. The more you learn about genes, the less determinist you should be, the more ready you should be to ask skeptical questions.